Hello, North Dakota, and welcome to our daily press briefing. Got some good news today, so a uh, little lighter day maybe today for all of us. Uh, but want to uh, start off right away with the news. Uh, today, the Department of Health confirmed 14 additional cases of the COVID-19, and uh, this is uh, comes on a day when we had our record uh, uh, or our record number of tests taken, uh, 835 tests taken, uh, 14 over 835, 1.6%. Uh, that's our lowest we've had uh, in this thing. And what that means uh, is uh, we continue to have a very flat, in this case, even declining rate. Now we understand, uh, and we'll talk this in a little more depth uh, as we go through this, that uh, we did do the, some of these numbers included in here are from Operation drive Through, which we did in Western North Dakota, where we were doing more broad-based testing of people that didn't have symptoms. So the pool of people that we were testing uh, was perhaps a, you know, a less of a target audience. So likely that we would have a lower percentage, uh, but we did learn some very valuable things out of that uh, tests which we'll cover. But the other piece right in the lower center of this graph, which I want to highlight, uh, is also that uh, 16 currently hospitalized. This is good news that we're down two. So two more people that are out of hospitalization. And this is a number we'll continue to highlight in the weeks ahead uh, is number of hospital beds. Because again, from a strategic standpoint, the whole point of everything that our country is doing to try to reduce the spread was to not get in the position uh, that we saw in Italy, that we saw in the New York metro area where you were actually uh, an area ran out of uh, medical care. And when you run out of medical care, particularly at the highest uh, level of licensing, when you don't have enough uh, ICU beds or uh, in intensive care, uh, critical access uh, type caregivers that can manage that with all the sophisticated equipment. That's where you can save lives is at that high end of care. And, and so again, trying to make sure that we can deliver the best possible care to all North Dakotans that might need it uh, if we uh, have a spike due to this highly uh, contagious and, and for, for those that are uh, older or have underlying health conditions, a highly deadly uh, disease. Uh, but the good news is then, as we've said before, we know that uh, we've got at least 2,600 beds uh, identified in the state with, and we're gonna, you're gonna hear plans about how we're gonna scale up from there. Uh, but again, 16 over 2,600, this is less than 1% of the beds, hospital beds in the state of North Dakota are currently being used for COVID. And so for those that think that the state isn't doing enough to slow the spread, I would <clears throat> ask them again to keep looking at the numbers and understand what we're trying to manage. Uh, which is we're trying to manage uh, capacity of hospital care. This is the, the, the two curves we talk about. One is the, the, the curve in the line, flattening the curve, which we're doing, and then raising the line for the hospital care. Uh, so then the other piece, which, uh, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll get to in a second in two slides, but let's just take quickly look at the, the number of new cases, the raw data, uh, the numerator here, uh, which again shows that, uh, the 12 cases that we reported today. Uh, but if we go to the, better piece of data where we're taking a cases, positive cases versus tests taken. This is the positive uh, test rates. Those remain low. Uh, and because of that wider spread testing over the weekend, you're actually seeing that curve flatten out. By comparison, again, for those that might be watching uh, and are <clears throat> nervous about you know, what was going on in the New York metro area, both New Jersey and New York had test positive test case rates in the, in the 40s, like 40 to 46% of the people tested were positive. Uh, when you're in that situation and with the possibility that every person that has it may infect two more, that's when you get into that uh, exponential growth. That's not where we are uh, right now at all. And it certainly shows that on the next slide uh, <clears throat> that we have. And this is our slide that shows <clears throat> again, uh, above the line is the active cases that we're managing. Uh, below the line is those that uh, have recovered or those that sadly that we that have uh, passed away due to the COVID-19. Uh, but you'll see if you net out uh, the new cases of uh, that we had for today, uh, the 14 new cases versus those that have recovered, uh, we actually went down 
uh, we actually went down in number of active cases. That's the first time that this has happened, uh, that active cases have gone from 54 to 53. So super encouraging news that we at least had one day uh, on, on our march. Uh, most other states have seen this line continue to just climb skyward. Uh, but again, given the lagging aspect of, this, of the data, uh, I want to just say thank you to everybody that's been practicing uh, all the guidance that we've been given because we're benefiting today from actions that people were taking several weeks ago, whether that's closing schools or businesses or personal care businesses. All of that reduced activity uh, is paying dividends uh, today. And so uh, one other piece of data that we want to address too uh, at the front end here is relative to uh, rate by counties uh, because there has been uh, you know, some uh, concern. I think people get stuck on the numerators uh, where we see stuff on social media, which is, hey, how come we're not doing more for Cass County? Uh, because uh, Cass County's got the most number of positives. Uh, newsflash, Cass County's our most populous state. Okay, so... When we get done with this, we are likely going to have the most number of cases in Cass County. What we're really managing in terms of what's a hot spot is whether or not the, the cases that you have, the positive cases, over the tests that are taken or over the population. So this is the positive rate. And you can see on the, the slide here on there that with Cass County at 4.3% uh, is got a far lower rate uh, than some of the counties in that we have in Western North Dakota, particularly Montreal, which jumps out at almost 17% rate. Uh, so again, that's where we're focusing uh, some of our task force and strike teams right now is into Montreal and working in conjunction uh, with Chairman Mark Fox, uh, Dr. Monica Mayer and MHA Nation, Scott Satermo, the whole team up there uh, that we're working with again uh, to try to make sure we're addressing uh, the, the outbreak uh, that, that uh, and we're working there with all all of the you know tribal officials and local officials there to make sure that we're doing a great job working together uh, to protect everybody in North Dakota. So again, we're doing a great job on getting testing done. There has been tests now taken in every county. Uh, if it's white on this slide, that means there's not yet a, a positive in that county. If there's no numbers in that county, those are the counties that don't yet have a positive. That doesn't mean uh, that that there isn't uh, that there isn't. Uh, COVID uh, disease in those counties. It just means we don't have a positive test case yet, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I think next up, uh, I want to talk a little bit about our guidance that we keep giving that we want to repeat every time, which is what we call North Dakota Smart. And again, uh, this is what's working. So today, uh, again, this is just a thank you to everybody that's doing these things, avoiding discretionary travel. Uh, when people have an opportunity to go to the grocery store, don't make it a family outing. Uh, if you can you know, send one person with a list, even better yet. Uh, if some places are still doing delivery or you can get pick up at the uh, order online and go pick it up. Uh, I want it again to uh, uh, the gathering in groups of 10 or more. Uh, we know that, uh, again, we're social, uh, social beings, but again, uh, gathering in 10 or more is, uh, is, is part of the guidance that we're giving right now. We want to restrict that. The, again, following state and local authorities, whether it's, uh, the, again, thank you to all of the business leaders, business owners that are, that are doing the, the hard work of closing their restaurants, their bars, their gyms, and other places. You're all making a difference. You're all heroes, and you're all saving lives. Again, the CDC guidance this week, we're seeing more and more of this happening, which is great that it's becoming uh, commonplace. Uh, here, the, that, uh, that everybody is wearing uh, cloth face coverings when out in public. Uh, I'm sure that one of the things that we're gonna see when we talk about the new normal, I think a lot of us, when we grew up as, uh, as kids, uh, none of us ever you know, knew what a bike helmet was. We never wore a bike helmet. People that ski didn't wear helmets. Uh, and now, uh, sort of the world we're living in, uh, it's a lot of people wouldn't understand that for your kids, it's smart for them to be wearing a bike helmet. When you're skiing, it's great to be wearing a helmet. Uh, I think for a while coming out the backside, we're going to see uh, masks as part of the new normal uh, as we get back to work. And so people that might be uh, putting that off, uh, I'm sure there is, as we speak right now, uh, all kinds of fashion masks being produced, camel masks, uh, 
you know, reproduced Halloween masks, uh, whatever it might be. I'm looking around the room today. There's some colorful ones in the room uh, that are out here today. Uh, so again, uh, we just want to say that uh, that is another way to protect yourself, your family, and others. And there's a lot of stuff online. If you say, hey, where do I get a mask? Can't afford a mask. Even the CDC has got videos on how to make masks out of out of T-shirts or cloth or sheets or rubber bands. There's a lot of ways to do it and uh, where it can even a uh, cotton covering can make a difference. Again, uh, one of the big ones, which we think is working, uh, this message is getting through, but if you're sick, uh, stay home. If you got symptoms, uh, you know, that, you know, cough, sneezing, uh, temperature, uh, stay home. If you feel that you need uh, your condition, uh, of course, uh, call your medical provider. Uh, and those others that we really want to make sure that we're helping them avoid contact is the older Americans who've got underlying health conditions or risk. I hear every day uh, great stories about people that are taking care of their parents or their neighbors uh, so that those uh, people that are more vulnerable don't have to go into high contact situations. And again, uh, practicing great sanitation and hygiene habits. Uh, one way to stop community spread is with hand hygiene. Again, if you're touching any thing that is a, what you'd call a, a public, uh, public location. You know, people keep asking me, why do I keep mentioning ATMs and gas pumps? Well, long before the pandemic came around, there was a study that was done about where germs collected in America and places that lots of people touched but, but were never often sanitized. Guess what was number one and number two? ATMs and gas pump handles. So there's actual data behind that as well. So anyway, when you're, but if you're grabbing the door, uh, going into a supermarket, uh, again, whether you're wearing wearing gloves or or, or using a hand sanitizer, uh, or washing your hands, all of that's really important uh, to avoid uh, the spread. Uh, and again, if you think you've touched a common area, the, the advice then is make sure you're not touching your face because that's how you could transfer it uh, from a, a surface to your hand. Uh, and into yourself. Anybody that knows anybody or has talked to anybody, and I've had a chance to visit with some friends last night, uh, two friends last night in other parts of the country who had friends that have passed away from this disease, uh, other people that have not passed away but have gone through this illness, been hospitalized and come out the other side. And I want to, again, if, you don't, if you're not in a position to know anybody uh, that has either died or been sick from this thing, I would encourage you to really get up to speed because this is not something that anybody would ever want to have. I mean, this is a, uh, you know, people describe uh, this as, you know, someone uh, in the later stages, this someone putting a pillow over your face and smothering you to death because it is a, uh, affects uh, lung capacity and breathing capacity. So again, really deeply grateful for all the people that are taking this deadly disease serious uh, and, and taking care of, of those uh, around us. So again, what we're doing here in North Dakota, uh, targeted action, a smart action to slowing the spread, a flatten the curve, we're saving lives, that is working. And again, there still uh, continues to be some murmur out there. I thought perhaps that we had, uh, that some of this would, was stopped uh, after Dr. Fauci on Monday talked about states uh, like North Dakota, what we're doing is functionally equivalent and totally compatible uh, with other states' orders. Uh, so we know that uh, the, the, the numbers speak for themselves, that it's working here. And again, uh, we have from the start said that this isn't as much about what government says, it's more about what individuals do. And we uh, continue to applaud and acknowledge that North Dakotans uh, understand that they have an individual responsibility and thank you all for taking that that individual responsibility seriously and exercising uh, all of these uh, smart practices uh, next up I want to talk about operation drive-in uh, as you heard uh, earlier uh, we had two locations on two days Saturday in Amadon uh, Sunday in Gladstone North Dakota uh, in Amadon North Dakota 367 samples were collected on in on, in, on in Gladstone 368 so about equivalent in both of those in southwestern public health North Dakota National Guard uh, and the uh, in people in Slope County, Gladstone Fire District helped on Sunday. Uh, one of the reasons why we did this, we asked, why did you do this? We wanted to test people more broadly uh, across the community, people that were not showing symptoms. There had really been almost none of this done in the entire US, and at least in North Dakota, we saw an opportunity because the time we selected Slope County, at that time there wasn't a positive in the county. By the time we got there, there was one. Uh, but one of the things we did learn was that three, we had three positives uh, in Slope and three in Gladstone. Half of the people that we tested there that came back as positive had no symptoms. 
So I guess I would just say we take a look at the numbers that we're showing across the state of North Dakota. If you're going to extrapolate that as a as a baseline, maybe a low conservative baseline, because these were areas that, that were late uh, to where the spread was occurring, uh, you could likely assume that for every person that we've that has been tested with symptoms uh, that's shown up on our list there's at least another one out there uh, that doesn't have symptoms and this can make a real difference and uh, and again when we talk about you know saving lives uh, we know that at least in one case uh, one of the individuals who had no symptoms who tested positive uh, was uh, in a close contact with someone uh, who was uh, would be considered to have uh, underlying health conditions uh, due uh, to some recent health conditions, you know, that again probably created an opportunity. That individual with the underlying health conditions tested negative, uh, but now we can separate those two and maybe save a life that way. So that's, you know, fantastic. Uh, we uh, uh, <clears throat> we, we know that when we're building our models uh, that this understanding that there could be uh, twice as many people out there as what we're catching uh, that have have symptoms and it, you, and you can be have no symptoms and you can still be a spreader and if you have no symptoms and you're in contact with a lot of people uh, and not following the rules that's what you'd be called a super spreader and we that's what we're trying to avoid because uh, that's where some of these outbreaks in other states have been traced back to asymptomatic asymptomatic people uh, that that were not following guidance so today uh, Switching to the next topic, uh, we want to uh, go to the uh, executive orders. And we have two executive orders. The first executive order today touches on uh, two important organizations. Uh, and one of those organizations is our Public Service Commission. And people in North Dakota would likely know that our Public Service Commission is uh, independently elected, three members. Currently, those positions are held today by Brian Krashas, Julie Fedorchek, and Randy Chrisman. Uh, and these uh, folks uh, do the important work that they're doing in inciting uh, and permitting uh, infrastructure across our state uh, is one of the things they do. When they do that, they hold public hearings. Sometimes those public hearings uh, go on for hours or days. They do a fantastic job of getting input from the public. Uh, but now, during this particular time, uh, it's important that we continue to get input from the public, but we do it in a way that protects the public. So in this executive order, um, it, is, it, it removes the requirement uh, that public uh, hearings uh, are held in specific locations, meaning that they can hold a virtual public hearing. And uh, talking to the Public Service Commission, getting input from them and with their full support on this, uh, there's actually uh, now with people uh, working from home, at home, uh, people from, from, you know, from a dispersed geography will be able to attend electronically. Uh, I think there's a chance uh, where we've seen this happen in other areas over the years, uh, such as when we were doing uh, oil leasing auctions and we went from on-premise to online. We actually increased the number of people that were participating. And so there's a, a, a optimism that we might actually be able to increase public uh, participation through this, but this gives them the flexibility to not be required uh, to have to have a physical specific location uh, and still be able to get that public input. The second one, which is still part of that same executive order, uh, relates to the land commissioner. Uh, the land commissioner uh, reports to the state land board. The land board is comprised of five elected officials, Attorney General Stengem, Secretary Jager, Treasurer Kelly Schmidt, uh, and Superintendent Baszler, uh, and myself. Uh, the land commissioner manages all the state lands uh, that are held across the state. Uh, many of you would know that that's uh, at statehood, that was section 16 and section 36 uh, in every township. Uh, at least in the western half of the state, uh, the state still owns most of those lands uh, and they're uh, held for public auction. The current way the law writes right now is that there has to be a a public auction physically located at the county seat. Uh, in today's world of online auctions and broad participation, uh, this is a requirement, a uh, piece of uh, red tape that probably uh, could be waived anyway, but uh, it, we're, we're waiving it right now through uh, executive order. And again, would expect uh, that with the all the still required notification and transparency uh, that we could even maybe get more participation in these. So those are, uh, Relate, suspending some requirements for the PSC and for the land commissioner. Uh, we had already 
uh, issued executive orders on March 30, allowing public meetings and hearings to be conducted by uh, remote means that that was applied to uh, school boards and city commissions, but this takes care of the sections of state law that were specific to the land board and the PSC. The, the next uh, one we wanna talk about, which is an interesting one. Uh, again, these are still things we, as you know, we had the executive order a couple weeks ago asking all agencies to identify red tape that we could get rid of. Uh, one of the things that uh, came up was that we had agencies and, and institutions, in this case, uh, institutions of higher education uh, underneath the North Dakota University system that had PPE uh, as in personal protective gear, and that could be for food service workers, but we're not serving, serving food in the, at the college, it could be for athletic trainers, but we don't have any athletic teams going on, but there's turns out there's a lot of PPE masks and other equipment in the university system. They wanted to donate it to the health department. Uh, current statute doesn't allow agencies to donate stuff to each other. Uh, you have to uh, forfeit it to the uh, surplus uh, equipment uh, team at, at the state of North Dakota, and then they uh, sell it back to everybody else. So it goes through a process of in and out uh, as opposed to directly. And this, uh, so this, uh, those rules remain for all other types of equipment, but relative to donations of PPE and medical supplies, um, we can bypass that, streamline that, and whether it's the North Dakota University system or other agencies that may have PPE, uh, they're now gonna be allowed to donate those supplies directly to the Department of Health uh, to be used in, the, in, the, in our medical cash, which can be used to support uh, the COVID fight across the state. Okay. Uh, Next up, more good news, hand sanitizer. Uh, we've talked about this. We said we'd be back with some more news. Uh, we know this has been in short supply uh, on local store shelves. Uh, and of course, as usual, North Dakotans, entrepreneurs and innovators aren't waiting for others to come up with solutions. Now we are aware there may be more, but we're aware of four vendors that are making hand sanitizer in the state. Uh, Three of them are supplying the product for sale to the general public, and you could contact them directly for payment and pickup times, but two of those are in, in uh, Bismarck and Mandan. Dakota Pharmacy on Main in Bismarck is supplying about 200 small bottles a day. Uh, you can pick, you pick those up, pay for those through the drive-in window. Uh, they're also distributing to hospitals, nursing home, and businesses, and they partnered with the local liquor shop, Will, Willie, Will Liquors, uh, to obtain the alcohol ingredient. Uh, of course, that's one of the the germ killing aspects of hand sanitizer. Uh, entrepreneurs uh, Marlo and Alice Anderson of Mandan who are well known for all kinds of great things they do uh, in this community, uh, but certainly known nationally for the National Day calendar. They're selling sanitizer at their awesome computer repair office at 712 West Main Avenue in Mandan. The ethanol they're using is coming from Red Trail Energy in Richardson. Uh, they're producing a lot of sanitizer. Uh, and then in Bismarck, uh, teaming up with other companies, uh, Maple River Distillery out of Castleton, uh, uh, in Big Oils LLC, which is an oilseed processing plant, uh, using their facility to make it. So that's what's happening in the western half of the state. In the Red River Valley, there's two going on, Red Pine Distillery and Grand Forks, uh, working to fill the needs of facilities that are at highest risk, such as hospitals, clinics, and assisted living. Uh, and first responders, uh, if they get their production up, they'll be selling to the general public. But thank you, Red Pine, for serving all of our health care in that area. Uh, and then Proof Distillers, which we've mentioned before, in downtown Fargo is producing and selling 300 gallons a week of, of uh, high and medium quality hand sanitizer. They're getting uh, the new biomass solution out of Grand Forks supplying 100,000 gallons of high quality ethanol to proof artisan distillers. And you might say, what does ethanol have to do with it? Well, it turns out an ethanol plant is actually just a giant still. Uh, it's a way to make alcohol. Uh, receiving bottles from Cass Clay and a company in Wisconsin. So they have, them, they have them, but if you've got bottles, save them because some of this may be in bulk. And we get to learn all kinds of things during a global pandemic. But it turns out that these products are not licensed uh, by FDA or by a Food and Drug Administration. They're licensed by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms because these are primarily alcohol. So uh, if you have uh, questions, call ATF. Uh, okay, uh, but again, great examples and fun uh, North Dakotan entrepreneurs and innovators stepping up to help meet a critical need and supply. 
Uh, next topic, uh, amended travel quarantine. Uh, given the uh, global pandemic uh, that we're in, it's important that we try to minimize exposure to people who have traveled from places with widespread disease. Uh, and that's why uh, we put in over a week ago, our state health officer issued travel quarantine for citizens returning from states on the CDC's uh, widespread COVID-19 list. Uh, and this was meant really aimed at snowbirds, spring breakers, and other travelers that are returning to North Dakota during this time of year. We are a net in-migration state. There are more people returning to North Dakota uh, than are leaving North Dakota. And, and, and that was working well. We heard from lots of snowbirds uh, who uh, came back uh, to North Dakota and were uh, enjoying a couple of weeks at home uh, before they uh, entered their more regular routines. So we thank everybody for that compliance. Uh, yesterday, Minnesota was added to the CDC's list with widespread COVID-19, uh, which raised a lot of questions for residents living along the border, uh, the Red River Valley, anticipating that at some point, if they keep adding people to the the list uh, you know that we might find that all of our neighboring states uh, are in that so today we uh, are announcing some um, uh, some am amendments to that quarantine to provide more more uh, clarity uh, but these apply to all states because we're anticipating that as this moves on uh, that every state may have that designation but first of all from an exemption standpoint uh, the if you're uh, Workers in essential critical infrastructure areas as defined by Homeland Security, they were already exempt. Uh, and then others that were exempt, people commuting to and from North Dakota for work or for essential supplies and services. Uh, immediately when Minnesota went on this list, uh, we had all kinds of people saying, hey, I'm an, a nurse, I live in uh, East Grand Forks, but I work at Altru in Grand Forks. Can I still go to work? Answer is yes. Uh, people in Fargo, uh, because they may get their drugs at Walgreens in Moorhead. Uh, and they said, hey, can we go to Moorhead? And if we go, can we come back? The answer is yes. Uh, so we've also included in here people engaging in outdoor activities such as walking, hiking, biking, running, driving for pleasure, hunting or fishing, going to available parks or other public things. We know that our border cities uh, of Wapton, Breckenridge, uh, Fargo, Moorhead, Grand Forks, East Grand Forks, a lot of those trail systems are, are interconnected uh, with bridges and going back and forth. So if you are going out for a bike ride or a walk with your family and you cross over a park bridge that takes you in a park in the other state and you come back again, uh, that's all exempted. Uh, we also uh, have got some questions about uh, out-of-state fishermen. We know that we did uh, close the paddlefish snagging uh, season. Uh, in northwestern North Dakota uh, at the confluence of the Yellowstone and the Missouri. But as we head into walleye season, and particularly with the great fishery we have around Devil's Lake in particular, and over 400 and some fantastically stocked lakes in North Dakota, we were actually, uh, people that don't fish may not know this, but we have had a lot of people in Minnesota buying a North Dakota fishing license in the last few years because of the great fishing here. Right now, there's very few out-of-state fishermen coming uh, this early. Uh, if we need to reevaluate this will in May, uh, but right now, uh, out-of-state uh, people coming uh, here to fish in our state uh, are exempted from this right now. As long as when they're doing this, they're remaining six feet apart. As we've said before, we see people start bunching up on bridges. Uh, we'll close fishing on bridges. We see people bump bunching up at, at boat ramps. We can close boat ramps. Uh, we'll continue to working with the game and fish to try to do this on a targeted, a targeted basis. Uh, but the key thing here is using common sense. Uh, if you've got a exception uh, to this rule and you say, well, you know, here's my common sense thing, uh, like I live in South Dakota, and but our post office is in North Dakota, because we actually have, if you look at the map of zip codes, there are zip code areas where people that live in another state, but they have a, a zip code. That happens both with South Dakota and Montana. If you have to drive into our state to pick up your mail, that would be considered essential. So the whole point of this is just use common sense and if you come up with some um, you know, intricate uh, thing that you think you're being blocked on doing this, let us know because this is meant to be the common sense order uh, for, for how we wanna uh, manage uh, this with, with travel. Uh, but again, if you are uh, traveling here, coming back, uh, I've been talking about the exemptions, but if you're coming here from a high, uh, a state that the CDC is considered a widespread state and you're coming back from Florida or Arizona, snowbirds still coming back, the 14 day quarantine still applies. Uh, no, we're not offering exemptions for that. 
Next up uh, is a, uh, a, we've got a guest speaker today. We're really pleased to have with us uh, Eric Hardmeyer, the Bank of North Dakota uh, president and CEO. He's going to talk to us the phone about some of the great work that they're doing. Uh, and uh, and I want to, again, thank Eric for his leadership. He's been president of the bank, I think, coming on 20 years now. And, and during that time, uh, the Bank of North Dakota has uh, more than doubled in size. It's had a record, I think, 16 or 17 years of record profitability. Uh, part of the way they've been able to do that is through uh, really managing the cost side. And I think you can see on the slide that one of the ways they've kept the cost down is that they're using Eric's uh, picture from high school graduation uh, as on this slide. Uh, but great work, Eric, you and your team. Thank Thank you. And uh, now we'll hear from Eric Hardmeyer, the youthful Eric Hardmeyer. Well, thank you, uh, Governor Burgum, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be part of the press conference today. So let me, let me first say that you know, Bank North Dakota does have uh, considerable experience in, uh, financing disaster recovery efforts. We've actually been doing this since 1997 with the, the flood in Grand Forks and also as recently as the flood in Minot. You know, we, we do understand that the, the scale of this is enormous, um, but the blueprint that we figured out in terms of uh, financing these, you know, will apply here as well. And we think the first thing that, you know, people should be aware is, is it is really important to utilize the federal programs. Uh, let them do their job first. Uh, the the uh, scope and magnitude of these Federal programs are of a size that, you know, North Dakota just can't compete with, nor should we. We, we don't want to duplicate efforts, and the programs that we have seen that come out and support uh, small businesses is, you know, nothing less than impressive. Um, at that point, B&D will assess, you know, our role. As often is the case, uh, there will be gaps. There will be uh, places for the Bank of North Dakota to follow up with. And it really is our intent to come out with a program that will, you know, uh, supplement uh, what the federal programs are doing. So uh, you can look forward to seeing that in the uh, days and weeks to come. Uh, certainly we know uh, that the Bank of North Dakota has a role here. Uh, we are the only state-owned bank in the nation, and we uh, are here to serve, you know, North Dakotans, and we'll do so with, you know, the um, – uh, all the ability that we have and the experience we have and the relationships that we have with the North Dakota banks out there that help us to deliver these programs uh, every day. Um, one thing that we wanted to announce today is that the, the Bank of North Dakota is going to uh, provide assistance to the banking community in delivering the uh, payroll protection program. I know that the governor has talked about that uh, in previous press conferences, uh, but of course that is, you know, the liquidity lifeline that the uh, federal government will be providing through uh, loans by SBA and delivered by uh, North Dakota banks. Um, and what we have determined is that there is a role for the Bank of North Dakota to assist these banks as they run into, um, you know, either liquidity problems, uh, sheer volume or just risk size that uh, they're not willing to take, the Bank of North Dakota stands ready to purchase, um, you know, these PPP loans, um, as they're called. Um, and I think most of you know that this program became available last Friday, and I'm happy to tell you that the, um, the North Dakota banks have been uh, getting after this in a way I think that um, you can feel proud of. Um, the, the communication between the banks, between the associations, uh, has been uh, incredible. Uh, SBA has been, uh, you know, uh, challenged by this, but I think that, you know, they've, they've come with uh, every uh, resource they can and are trying to work through the technical issues. As, as we worked with the, uh, the banks across the state, what we have um, determined is that there is going to be significant interest in this program. You know, through the first week or so, we are aware that there's up to 4,000 loans that have been or will be processed, uh, totaling just over a billion. Um, we think that might be the start of it. This number could grow uh, significantly as uh, more of the uh, technical issues get resolved. And so that's why the Bank of North Dakota has uh, determined that 
you know, there is a role for us to play here to help these banks as they want to continue to to deliver this program and may run into, as I said, a uh, liquidity or a volume issue. Um, we continue to uh, work with the student loan uh, uh, cohort that has loans with the Bank of North Dakota through uh, yesterday. We have uh, worked with over 4,000 borrowers deferring their payments for up to six months. Uh, we will provide interest rate relief uh, that is coming. And as we uh, compare our program to what the federal program has delivered, um, we find that uh, our our benefit is superior to that of the federal government in terms of our permanent reduction of student loans. And so, you know, Governor, with that, um, you know, I'd stand for any questions, but just as a kind of a finishing statement, I would say that, you know, we, we at the bank fully uh, understand and appreciate the unique role that we play in, in North Dakota and, you know, have our sleeves rolled up and uh, ready to go to work figure out how it is that we can best serve North Dakota to get us through this uh, really unique, um, uncertain time. So with that, uh, back to you, Governor. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you and your leadership team for all the great work you're doing. Uh, and stick around uh, for the question and answers, which we'll do uh, do at the end. Uh, but again, it, we're so fortunate in North Dakota to have an institution that's on such a solid footing uh, and that's got a 100-year history in our state of serving the citizens of North Dakota and has got deep experience with disaster recovery, uh, particularly when we come to this time where so many of the federal programs uh, involve assistance, uh, some of which are delivered through our local community bank. So I want to also thank uh, all of the local community banks in North Dakota and all of the banks we have. We have one of the strongest uh, set of banking partnerships. Uh, in. If you take our state compared to any other state and take a look at the number of local community banks and the strength of their balance sheets, we're in great shape. And one of the reasons is because of the, their partnership with the Bank of North Dakota. So thanks, Eric, and your team. Uh, uh, next up, uh, I want to talk about some other business topics, and we've talked about this before, uh, but there are so many opportunities uh, during this uh, time of, of really, I'll call it financial calamity, uh, to access new programs. But that takes entrepreneurs and innovators whose businesses are closed, uh, got to gotta be entrepreneurs another way and be proactive in another way, which is learning everything you can about these programs. And tomorrow, uh, we're going to have our fourth business briefing tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, this is a statewide available uh, dial-in. The session is free. Uh, you can register at ndchamber.com. We want to thank the sponsors, the, uh, the Greater North Dakota Chamber, uh, clear for everybody watching, you do not need to be a North Dakota, a Greater North Dakota Chamber member to attend. They're the hosts. Uh, we thank them for this, but it's free. Uh, and uh, this is an opportunity uh, for us to try to reach everybody in North Dakota. They're, they're helping uh, host it. The Department of Commerce is delivering the, the content tomorrow. So you'll hear from Michelle Comer, Eric Hardmeyer, uh, and many other folks. 97% uh, of the people that listened uh, Last week, 2,200 people dialed in last week. 97% on survey agreed it was uh, was agreed or strongly agreed the session was a valuable use of time. Really well organized, well delivered, great content. 1,100 people have registered, so reserve your space now for tomorrow, 11 a.m. Central Time business briefing uh, at ndchamber.com. We want to also uh, <clears throat> talk a little bit about behavioral health, which we do. Uh, we've committed to do this at every uh, every uh, session. Uh, I know that uh, <clears throat> there was an article, I think, that came out in the forum that talked about uh, increase in overdoses. Uh, we've talked about this, that the risk of a period of isolation and, and change with schools closing, businesses closing, uh, layoffs occurring, uh, that this is going to challenge uh, our society as a whole. And human beings are social beings and our social groups are have always been an important part of our identity and they teach us skills that help us thrive and feeling socially connected is more important than ever uh, and while we're again doing the the distancing the physical distancing we want to make sure we're maintaining the social connectedness and staying social has got connected has got a lot of health benefits Many, many studies talk about that if you are, you know, connected uh, to others with strong relationships, it improves your quality.
quality of life. It boosts your mental health. People live longer. People recover faster from illnesses. It decreases our risk of suicide. So many, many health benefits from that. Uh, and this is not just a few. There's over 148 studies with over 300,000 participants uh, indicated that individuals with stronger social relationships had a 50% increase uh, likelihood of survival. Um, this remains true across a number of factors, whether it's age, uh, gender, uh, uh, initial health status, cause of death, etc. So we want to be grateful that we're living in a time of technology where we can connect by virtual means. And again, lots of ideas out there, whether it's on parentslead.org or other places where new, new forms and new ideas about putting together virtual parties to celebrate birthdays, virtual work together, uh, getting together with friends. Uh, last night, I participated in a call with about 25 uh, classmates of mine. Uh, they were calling in from all over the world, and it was super interesting and super valuable to learn about uh, what was happening in their world. And again, we can all do that. There's a lot of free products that are out there to allow people to, to do that. Uh, but of course, uh, if you don't want to learn new technology, you can always pick up the telephone, uh, write a letter, uh, leave a note for a neighbor. Those things are all there. I do want to give a shout out to uh, Eli, age seven. That'd be Eli Fox, Chairman Mark Fox. He had a birthday party uh, last uh, Saturday. Uh, they're practicing all their good physical distancing. So it was just the mom and dad and the chairman and a brother. Uh, but over 300 people uh, sent Eli wishes on Facebook and he got lots of lots of uh, video uh, happy birthday song sung to him. So again, as we're, kids might be grieving because they're missing milestones, important days like birthdays, uh, there's ways we can come with new ways to celebrate that. And again, uh, starting right here in Bismarck, uh, that hashtag World of Hearts, great example of using social media to build connectedness. I think that we saw that it was a phenomenon that started here, uh, sprang up here, spread across the country and eventually around the world uh, to help create that uh, experience of connectedness uh, as we all go through something uh, challenging we've never been through and, and affirming that we're all in this together. And so again, if you want to learn more about social connectedness and ways to connect, again, behavioralhealth.nd.gov uh, forward slash COVID-19. I want to also mention again, just a special note uh, today on Wednesday of, of, uh, of Holy Week. Uh, it's you know critical that we continue practicing physical distancing recommendations and avoiding in-person gathering. I know that uh, many, 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 the vast majority of churches across the state are following this guidance by offering online or virtual resources to include uh, uh, the spiritual support that they're providing for their congregation. And you can find those on your church's website, you know, go on a Google search. Uh, Traditionally, holidays like what's coming up, uh, you know, typically this weekend, there'd have been an Easter holiday with school off on Friday and Monday and traveling to grandparents and, and all of the traditions that, that we, uh, that people might have had uh, during that, uh, that time frame. And those are going to, those traditions are being disrupted this year. Uh, but again, I ask people to plan ahead, think about how you can continue to practice that physical distancing uh, in order to keep our, our communities healthy. And, and again, uh, with uh, today uh, for uh, begins Passover uh, and tomorrow, mon tomorrow, Monday, Thursday, Friday, Good Friday, Sunday, Easter Sunday. Uh, during this time, again, uh, the desire for connectedness is going to be there, but uh, we're at that point uh, again where we have not yet faced the steep part of our curve. And, uh, and again, I would remind uh, people again, an example I've used before of a funeral that happened in Eastern Canada where people said, it's okay, it's just one funeral, it's really important. 60 people out of a small congregation came down with COVID, including some deaths. So again, it could be a life-saving choice to figure out a way to provide both familial and spiritual support to each other uh, in ways other than in person. Uh, closing topic or two topics before we close to go to questions. Uh, unemployment update. <clears throat> uh, yesterday, uh, Tuesday, uh, 1,844 employment claims. That brings us to 42,362 claims since March uh, 16th. Uh, there's uh, more data available on the Jobs ND website, uh, but I would include uh, that we've talked about this. Again, wanting to get the word out, but it's called the Pandem Pandemic Unemployment Assistem Assistance. Uh, I'm sure it'll turn into an acronym, uh, PUA, but Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, those for self-employed independent contractors and gig workers. Uh, that just went live on April 4th. We've had 2,568 uh, 
of those uh, fi claims filed uh, and uh, and uh, and 624 of those yesterday. So the word uh, is getting uh, out on that. And so again, I uh, would want to encourage people that if you in the past thought, hey, I'm not covered by unemployment, uh, you might be today. So check it out at jobsnd.com. Uh, closing with another piece of good news. Uh, yesterday, you were all here, uh, part of the launch uh, of the CARE 19 app. Uh, this is an app uh, to help facilitate contract contact tracing. Contact tracing is the uh, goes hand uh, in glove. Uh, as I said yesterday, we've got a quarterback and receiver. You can have a great quarterback like Carson Wentz if you don't have great receivers to throw to. I mean, we can do all the testing we want, but when we find a positive, we need to make sure we're following up with contact tracing to find out who that positive has been in contact with uh, and make sure that those are being quarantined or, or, uh, or being isolated to stop the spread. And the way we can do that uh, is uh, right now, that's a very manual process with people making phone calls. As we've described, some people that work in healthcare are, are being asked and required by their employers to keep a paper log of who they've been in contact with. So if they ever do test positive, they pull out the paper log and they go, well, here's where I've been and here's where I saw. We've got technology. Anybody that's got a, a smartphone in their pocket, anybody that's got Google Maps uh, or Apple Maps or any mapping uh, tool on your phone, uh, your phone is tracking where you're going. Uh, so in an anonymous way within CARE 19, it just tracks none of your data. You don't have to provide your, your own personal information. You don't have to provide a credit card. You don't have to log in. You don't need a password. It anonymously tracks your data. It assigns you a 36 digit random number uh, that is tied to that location data. And if and when down the road, you find out that either you're positive or somebody else uh, around you is positive, uh, you're gonna be able to use that data to help protect and save lives. And so again, uh, we have 10,205 people have already downloaded the app. Uh, we know that, uh, understand just before I came up here that South Dakota uh, is gonna uh, adopt it and go live with this maybe as early as tomorrow. Uh, and I know that the uh, Tim Brookins, who was here by a phone uh, yesterday online, uh, who's the developer from uh, Proud Crowd, uh, Proud Crowd uh, the developer of the Bison Tracker, if those 15,000 people that have used the Bison Tracker, you know the kind of app we're talking about. Uh, that uh, he's already gotten a call from the chief operating officer uh, from the state of Iowa. And I know that Nebraska and Wyoming have also uh, heard about it and are thinking about this as well. So we could see this uh, spreading around. I think there were, uh, <clears throat> well, I know there was hundreds of news stories uh, in as far away as the Japan Times wrote a story on this app. Uh, so to say that it's gonna get interest just in the Midwest, it's already getting international interest because uh, these are the kind of tools uh, that could help us slow the spread in a targeted way, uh, as opposed to these broad-based uh, where, where we have to close down the entire economy. This is a way for us to be very targeted, particularly on the back end as we're coming out of this. Uh, the, the virus will still be around and we're still gonna have positive cases pop up. We're still gonna need contact tracing. We're gonna need contact tracing all the way through to when we've got a vaccine. Uh, and that could be what, 12 to 18 months from now. So this is not a tool for the next few weeks. This is a tool that could, could really help the nation navigate uh, its reopening. So excited and again, thank you to uh, the CARE 19 team and Tim Brookins, Darren Laybourne, Microsoft, ProudCout, everybody that worked on that. With that, we'll open for questions. Uh, Newsflash, we've apparently answered all questions today, so there'll be no, we, just that, we did that great of a job. No, uh, who's going first? Jeremy, Jeremy, Jacob, Tom, Lane. Lane, do I usually go to my left first? Is that what happens usually? Okay, all right, well, okay. <clears throat> That's weird because usually I would go to the right first, but except with the basketball. People who know me in basketball know that I that I got a good left hand. So, okay. Okay, Jeremy. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could define essential supplies and services as they relate to the amendments to the quarantine order. Uh, the original uh, tool that we used was the Homeland Security List, and we would just refer people to that. Homeland Security's got a list of all the essential services. And, uh, and when we were talking about the, the travel, the original travel amendment uh, had exceptions uh, for people in essential services. So, you know, that includes energy, healthcare, agriculture, uh, food, pharmacy, all of that stuff. But, right, but 
Isn't the new amendment to that, isn't that for, I guess that would be for people going across the border for groceries or that, that sort of thing? Yeah, it's all the common sense stuff. If you live in a border city and you're coming back and forth and getting groceries or one way or the other, that's all the common sense. But we, the, the prior order already encompassed the idea that if you were, uh, well, Minnesota wasn't a hot spot state till yesterday, but it, it, it had uh, covered for the fact that if you were coming from a hot spot to be a nurse in North Dakota, uh, you could come and work and didn't have to quarantine for 14 days. If that, in those ex exceptions where that happened, the providers were testing those people before they put them on the floor. Uh, but we did have inbound medical people that were coming from states before. So that's all carried out in the exceptions. Okay, but just, just to be clear, it applies now to people who are seeking essential services and, and uh, supplies now to not just workers, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, if you're a consumer and, if, you know, like I said, if you're, if you're a consumer and your pharmacy is on the North Dakota side and you live in Minnesota or vice versa, you can, you know, fire away. We're, we need to treat the metro areas uh, as effectively as we can as one community because that's the way it works. So we're not trying to create a barrier where there is, isn't one along those uh, border cities. Uh, we've actually got a town in that's not as well known as Fargo or Grand Forks or Wapton Breckenridge on the, but I was there last year during the flooding on the Montana, uh, North Dakota border where the line actually runs down Main Street. So there's actually part of the town is in Montana and part of the town is in North Dakota. This does not apply to, you can go back and forth to either side of that town without that applying. The school was on, uh, school was on one side of town, the post office on the other. One, the school was flying a one state flag, the post office was flying another state flag, but it's the same community. Okay, I think it was going to Jacob. Uh, Governor, around the time there were about uh, 70 to 80 positive cases in North Dakota. You said we should expect that number to jump tenfold in the coming weeks. Uh, with the coming weeks now passing and we haven't hit those numbers, uh, is, uh, is that more of a reflection of the models being used to project or is that more of a question of uh, the amount of testing in the state? I think it's a, a reflection of the fact that great work that North Codens are doing to slow the spread. I mean, I think that if you look at, uh, you know, any of the models from two or three weeks ago, they, they would have had us into the climbing part of the curve uh, by this part of April. But it's, as you saw today, we're, we're flat uh, right now. And that's a, that's a great, place, great place for us to be, but it reflects that the, the, strategies, the strategies are working. Tom, and then Lane. Governor, lots of chatter on the western part of the state about masks and the possibility of some kind of order. Uh, we've got the CDC that has recommended masks now. We've got a sheriff in uh, Riverside County, California, who's uh, saying he's going to arrest people that don't wear a mask. Uh, do you have any appetite at all for an order to wear masks? I, I don't have an appetite for an order because uh, I, I think, again, uh, they're not, not, we don't have enough law enforcement uh, in this state uh, really to take care of the uh, people that are breaking the law, much less, you know, trying to say, now we got to police every citizen. I mean, we're not a police state. We're an individual responsibility state. Uh, and I would encourage uh, people that, again, if you, uh, you know, I would encourage employers, if you've got an employee uh, that's working at a checkout a lane in a grocery store and they're seeing 100 people a day, I would make sure they're wearing a mask in addition to the plexiglass. I would make sure that you've got separation uh, so that those carts are six feet apart. I would put arrows on the floor and make sure that people are going one way down the aisle and not two ways. I mean, I would do a bunch of common sense stuff that businesses can do. Uh, and again, you know, everybody in healthcare uh, has always worn masks. I mean, we've had, you know, dentists uh, back when they were open they're open now only for emergency. They were always wearing masks. People under people in healthcare understood the value of masks, and I think that we're understanding now that with the uh, with the highly contagious nature of this, that masks can be a real deterrent in slowing the spread. And when you slow the spread, then you can again save lives. So would encourage. Uh, encourage people to do that when they're in situations, particularly if they're gonna be close to people that are not part of their pod, that's the new word. I mean, if it's your own family unit, so you don't have to wear a mask around the house with the people that you're already exposed to. Uh, but if you're a, uh, you know, coming to work, I would make sure that your coworkers that are going back to their own pods, you're either six feet apart from them like we are here or that you're wearing masks. I mean, that would be common sense for right now. And that another way, very inexpensive way, because the, the one thing about wearing a mask is uh, it's, 
it's something that you can do that's a courtesy to others and it doesn't really restrict your freedom. I mean, that's the other thing when I'm talking about using the bike helmet thing on the back side. I mean, having, having bike helmets as an option for kids saves lives, but it doesn't stop where a kid can bike. I mean, you know, maybe we'd have been even more crazy when I was kids in terms of building ramps and jumping if we had helmets. I'm not sure, but maybe it, it would promote uh, more dangerous activity. But I, I think that we have a, uh, a you know, they're, we're coming. We're going to see masks uh, being uh, part of the culture. Where maybe we thought, "Hey, that's just something that goes on in China." But I think, in the until there's a uh, until there is a, a a vaccine. I mean, you might uh, there might be a recommend. Might next fall, you might be seeing elderly people with underlying you know conditions choosing to wear a mask every time they go out. Might be a smart decision for them if we if this thing is still uh, if the virus is still running around uh, in its you know deadly uncontrolled fashion. Okay, Lane. Uh, Governor, we were informed that a Bismarck Child Care Center has had multiple providers test positive for COVID-19, and now all of the children that go there are being tested as well. Does this change your stance on keeping the child care centers open? I, that's the first I've heard of that, so uh, I know that our Department of Health team and our Human Services team will, will follow up on that, uh, but we're, it doesn't change our position. I mean, one of the great news, the great things, I mean, there, if there's a blessing in this worldwide pandemic uh, is that uh, this is, has been a, uh, if you're under the age of 20, uh, the mortality rate of this thing is uh, a rounding error around the world. And those cases uh, that have occurred usually have had an underlying health condition. Uh, and so uh, not saying there's, there's zero risk, uh, but this feels a lot more like, uh, you know, the, for, the, for the younger generation, this is certainly something that is that they can get through. And, and having those child care centers open for critical workers, that's how we keep our health care workers, our first responders, and everybody in the workforce to be able to protect those that are most vulnerable. But I say we will, I mean, we'll absolutely, when we hear something like that, where there may be confirming whether there are positives there, we will absolutely be following up. And then that's where we can try to bring the sort of the strike team testing in to make sure people get tested. So that we, so that that one outbreak doesn't turn into everybody going home and affecting their families and their families affect their neighbors. I mean, this is why this, you know, we don't ever want to get complacent because, uh, you know, we're, we're always one day away from an outbreak here during this time that we're at right now. But, you know, today was a good day, but uh, we, we have to be, uh, continue to, to stay really, uh, really alert in terms of how we're managing this. Dave, and then Jacob. Yeah, this is for Eric Hardmark. Okay, okay, great question for Eric. Eric, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, Governor. Radio le legend Dave Thompson has a question for you. <laughs> Banking legend, Eric. So, uh, <laughs> Eric, uh, you mentioned that uh, maybe there was some kind of technical issues in terms of rolling out the Paycheck Pro Protection Program. Uh, is it basically, can you describe them in relatively simple terms? Is it problems with applying for it or is it problems with getting the money out? Uh, thanks for that question, Dave. Uh, no, really, the, the problem has to do with more of a, a technical system issue with um, the, the ability of SBA to handle, you know, 4,000 different banks sending in uh, applications over what they call their e-tran system. So it was uh, more scale than anything, um, and it just having to work through, through some of those bottlenecks. Um, uh, as we understand it, you know, these... Uh, Loans are starting to be processed now at a greater uh, rate, and the money is starting to go out the door. So it's just really a uh, you know a delivery system with a uh, system that had never had to go through that kind of scale before. Thanks, Eric. And uh, I understand we are having a little technical difficulty with questions online, but uh, so apologize to those. Uh, uh, media from around the state, but have we got one coming in from Mask Mike? I do. I have uh, Alan Burt from the Evans County Record asking, why are tests still restricted this far into the pandemic? Why are people not being tested before being quarantined, especially medical staff? Uh, I see it. Mylon Tufty is here. Mylon, do you want to come up and answer that one? Did you, did you catch the question?
So the question about why think testing is still limited across the, the state and the country, it's because we're in a national pandemic and some of the supply chain has been impacted. There's a lot of demand for testing and, and we in North Dakota should be fortunate and, and proud that we have been able to open up testing to so many people. I think the other question that is asked is, um, are healthcare workers prioritized? And absolutely, healthcare workers are prioritized for testing and their um, employers allow them and help them get the testing so that they can return to work and feel safe that they're not spreading disease. And, and, and again, part of that question was the presumption that we had healthcare workers quarantined for 14 days. I had not heard that. If we do, uh, I guess I would ask those healthcare providers to reach out to the Department of Health uh, and let's have a discussion because we're trying to make sure that we can test healthcare workers and get them back on the front line. But thank you, Mylene. Tom, then Jacob. So my question's for Eric as well. Hey, Eric. Great. Back to you, Eric. So bankers are working overtime. In fact, I was able to get a hold of one banker Sunday night at about 10 o'clock at the bank, which surprised me. Are you saying that uh, Bank of North Dakota is going to be able to help these smaller banks with the overload of paperwork that they have to get these things out? Yeah, well, thanks for that question. You know, the, the paperwork that FDA is requiring is not onerous. Um, in fact, they, they've really streamlined the process to... Uh, to, to minimize the amount of paperwork uh, coming in and going out that needs to happen. Um, there is some documentation that will need to occur, but, um, you know, by and large, what SBA has done here making these, you know, unsecured loans um, uh, has, has really streamlined the process uh, greatly. But where we're able to really help uh, the banks is, um, you know, some of them, quite frankly, have reached, uh, you know, limits in terms of how many they can do, the, the the volume, the scale, the, the risk that they're willing to take. And so that's where B&D will come in and, and uh, help those banks take some of that off of their books um, and allow them to make more loans um, and, and stay within their uh, risk parameters. Thanks, Eric. Jacob, and then we have another one online. Governor, uh, you make a lot of sports references. You clearly miss sports, as a lot of us in this room do. And uh, as much fun as it is listening to you talk about NDSU football, my friends and I in Grand Forks are wondering if you have any comments on the prospect of the NHL playing some games in North Dakota. Well, uh, I think that would be uh, fantastic if that happened. Uh, I did see an article the other day that uh, most of the uh, – uh, UND hockey team was planning on returning next year. I mean, uh, we talk about Class B a lot, but I mean, I think we had a real shot at bringing home another national championship with a fantastic hockey team they had this year. And so it's great that those folks are coming back uh, again next year because I know we'd love to have everybody see that see that group of talented players uh, uh, make a run again. Uh, but <clears throat> we certainly have the facility. I mean, we know that the Ingolstead Center is uh, better than many of the. Uh, arenas in the NHL, uh, and so I'm assuming that's where uh, you're suggesting they'd be playing. Uh, but that would be uh, be fun if that that would be fun if that could happen. And if we have to go outside, I guess we could we could pull our own Mystery Alaska kind of a game, outdoor game. All right, movie reference for people watching. Lane, you're next, and then online. Oh, sorry, Mike, were you next? I think you're next. Online, then Lane. Um, the hospital in Mine. Oh, sorry, uh, Gene Shemp from Hometown Radio Group, Mine on Black Hill. The hospital in Minot is releasing the number of positive COVID-19 positive patients currently in their hospital. Florida, New York, and Washington State are all releasing COVID cases by city and in many cases down to the zip code. These states are releasing this information no matter how large or how small the community. Clearly, HIPAA is not an issue. Why is North Dakota still not releasing cases by city? So residents realize it is in their community and realize that they need to work to stop the spread. Okay, we'll turn that one over to Mylin because I know we've been been working on this one. So for us here at the state of North Dakota, we have taken a stance on what information we are trying to re we are releasing because we are entrusted to protect people's safety and and the information that they share with us. 
Um, if the Minot Hospital determines that that's information that they have received approval from their patients to release, that's up to the Minot Hospital. I think the main thing we should um, all assume and understand is there are people that are asymptomatic that are in your community that do have COVID-19. And we um, need to make sure that we're not stigmatizing these individuals. We need to make sure that we're good neighbors and we need to make sure that for us as healthcare professionals that we are entrusted with information that um, is sensitive and isn't necessarily um, allowed to be personally identifiable. And Mylin, also on the zip code question, uh, are, are we, do we have that up somewhere? We don't have it up yet. Don't have it up yet? Okay, so we're working on the zip code because we know other states have done uh, zip code, uh, but there <clears throat> we've got so few people in some of our zip codes that might actually share too much. So we're taking a look at that or how we might group those zip codes. But yeah, we want to be as transparent as possibly we can while still protecting data, but I want to uh, protecting that personal health data. But I want to really emphasize what my Lynn said, uh, which is everybody's got to assume that there's COVID everywhere, including those that are not symptomatic, which is what our testing in Western North Dakota on the, on the Operation Drive-In proved where half the positives came from people that, that were reporting no symptoms. So assume it's everywhere, act accordingly. We got time for one more? Okay, I got, I got one in the back over here and then back to Lane. I'm gonna do two more all the way back over here. Hang on. How many of the 735 tests collected at Amidon and Gladstone are included in today's results? Uh, how many of the 735? Uh, I was just going to try to do, Can we'll, we'll get you that thing. I, I think we had about, what, 260 were in yesterday's. Does that sound about right? So does that mean maybe uh, two, days in a row. two days in a row? So it was spread over two days, but we'll get you the information of how that was, how they were spread. Lane? Um, in reference to the project drive through were you surprised to see only six positive cases? And with the big turnout, are you planning on expanding that anywhere else in North Dakota? Uh, not surprised, pleased to see the low number of positives, uh, but also uh, not that we want to find out that there are asymptomatic, meaning people with no symptoms are out and about, but I think it's a good reminder to all of us that in, in that case where we did sort of a wide cast a wide net that half the, half the people that came up positive didn't have symptoms. I think that's a, uh, that was good learning uh, for us and anybody else that's building models. Will we do it again? I think where we wanna take that, if we have extra testing resource like we did for a couple days last weekend where we had some more capacity than we had uh, demand coming in from the medical providers is we wanna be able to use that uh, in more of a strike team approach. So if we have a hot spot, we can come in uh, and test a lot of people. Your example of a child care center, uh, if we got a breakout in a rural area, we could move in. If we got a, 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 a discover a positive in a nursing home, uh, like we already had done prior to this, one in Fargo where we tested all 120 residents and 60 staff after a positive, you know, one positive was found. I mean, I think that's another way we want to use that extra resources as kind of a strike team of, of testing, followed up by contact tracing around there, which again brings us back to, you know, Care 19, Apple App Store, Android coming in a week, download it uh, and help be part of it. Uh, let me close with uh, uh, just a note of uh, gratitude. Uh, and again, I, I think this is a, something that I want to just share, uh, which again, <clears throat> uh, gratitude leads to resilience. And so the note of gratitude here is uh, at a time when where I think a lot of people are really locked into their computer screens and maybe that's because, hey, you're at home, you're working from home and you got your computer screen, you got TV screens, you got uh, st streaming going on, uh, cable channels going on. Uh, there is uh, real health benefits to unplugging for a while and it's really hard to do in the 24 hours news cycle. But I think uh, someone sent me a picture the other day of a, uh, you know, crocus trying to pop its way up out of the ground uh, in uh, through a little snowbank, uh, and I you know we 
we look outside, I hear more birds chirping every day. I think at this time in North Dakota, in springtime, is always one of optimism. I mean, our agricultural roots in the state get people to start thinking about getting back in the field and getting into the ground and the whole cycle of life that's, that is happening. And I just, I would encourage everybody uh, when you, uh, if you unplug for an hour, uh, take a look at the beautiful state of North Dakota. Take a look at the amazing place that we live. And I think what you can add to that is something that I have, which is wonder, uh, just true wonder and awe about what a beautiful place this is. And, uh, and, and with that, can, that can also give us the strength and the optimism that know that together that we're going to uh, make it through this. And uh, today was a good day. We're going to have some, certainly we'll have some more bad days ahead of us, but today was a good one, one day at a time, uh, with a lot of wonder, a lot of gratitude. Uh, that, that'll help drive our resilience, uh, and we'll get it done. But thank you to everybody in the state uh, that is uh, practicing uh, their individual responsibility and doing it well to save others. So uh, be smart, North Dakota. Stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. Thank you.